and every one of you. And <clears throat> thank you to Stasia for her introduction. We'll have a short guided meditation, a little bit on the theme as well, for around um, 10 to 15 minutes. Then that will follow on with a uh, uh, talk. And from there, there'll be some uh, breakout rooms. Stasia will speak to you about that uh, at that time. But firstly, let's have a, a short meditation together. <clears throat> So we are just uh, sitting. If you're in the chair like myself, two feet on the floor, sitting rather tall. And just experiencing a certain stillness of the posture. Allowing the whole be being just to uh, settle down with a certain uh, full sense of uh, presence. Calm and a certain quietitude and stillness is an important foundation for reflection. One area for reflection is our, our, our responses to today. What has been our, our primary experience today? What stands out for us? What have I learned from a primary experience during today? Has anything occurred to me which is uh, informative, insightful, worth remembering. Is my sense of today conscious 
rather mindful, caring. During today, perhaps, we have had communications with others in the physical world, in the world of uh, Zoom, social media, text. Would we share anything of depth? Did we listen to any needs, concerns of the other or others? What was our response? What was our relationship today to the non-human world? animals, creatures, the natural world, <clears throat> food and drink, clothing, activities. Are we mindful of our environment and our relationship to what we see, hear, smell, taste and touch? So we are exploring the inner life <clears throat> and our <clears throat> engagement with life. Day in and day out. There's a great priority in undertaking. remaining minutes or so.
May all beings abide with calm. May all beings live with clarity. May all beings engage in wise action. Okay, thank you for lending an ear. So let me get your seat forward a little bit. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> let's get a sip of the water here. So, <clears throat> I'll speak to you for a little while, around 25 minutes, perhaps uh, half an hour. And <clears throat> in talking uh, with you, delighted to have the opportunity to speak with some um, mindfulness teachers. I was reading on the Amber, the Amber uh, website, the uh, European, a uh, number of European um, practitioners, teachers uh, around. And I think the connection of the collective is a really important principle because it contributes to the sharing of ideas, uh, inspiration, uh, and that can lead to an engagement with the world. So sometimes, as a small point here, we are feeling stuck. We're feeling um, uninspired. We are, whatever, disappointed that there are not enough people in the groups or in uh, coming to learn or, or, or whatever. It could be a, a sign that we ourselves need nourishment. We ourselves need fresh uh, initiatives. And it seems to me it's particularly uh, significant and important in the uh, in other areas and including the, the world of mindfulness. I'll just take a minute or two with my background. Um, as was mentioned, um, I spent these years, 10 years, about 10 years in the East, six of them as a, a Buddhist monk. And my, uh, my, my, my first retreat lasted from for about three years and three months, which is probably longer than most of you. And we started at four o'clock in the morning and we finished at around 10 p.m., 365 days a year. Books were strongly discouraged. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it was all the reading that goes with it. And we were even discouraged the monks and the nuns from meditating in our huts because the teacher didn't quite trust us to be meditating. So pretty well everything outside of the monsoon was uh, in the ground. Everybody could see everybody day in and day out. But there it was an interesting period of uh, time uh, 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 there and I'm eternally grateful uh, for it. When we come to the West, <clears throat> changes are underway. <clears throat> And there's a very strong principle of practice and service going together. They are united, they are inseparable. And to come back to the earlier point, teachers need nourishment. <clears throat> <clears throat> and that finding of nourishment contributes to uh, insight, to freight state taking fresh steps. And that means some adventure <clears throat> in the exploration. I'd come, <coughs> pardon me, I'll come <clears throat> to uh, Totnes for a moment. <clears throat> Where's the beloved water? <clears throat> Something needs some nourishing here the throat. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Totnes is a town of 8,400 8, people. And it's 
quite well known in Britain for the diversity of exploration which is going on. That's personal, spiritual, social, religious, um, environmental, lifestyle, and more. One of the Sunday newspapers described, said, in Totnes, it's a town where only psychotherapists and their clients live. They weren't far off the mark, set sort of town. And I'm one of those who are happy to live here. What's important about the point that I'm making is that if we are to develop a mindfulness society, we have got to meet others. Not just mindfulness teachers in the classical way that you and I have been trained, but to meet others outside of our networks. What are other people doing? What are their ideas? How are they applying it? <clears throat> and to give <clears throat> some um, examples of this, as, as <clears throat> Stasi made reference to Consciousness Cafe. So in this case, a professor of consciousness. He set this up years ago, began inviting various people, and regularly, usually, I think it's about... I think maybe once a month or more. There's a speaker. I'm on duty uh, tomorrow evening. And instead of this classic form, this is worth remembering here, it's for two hours. The first, after the introduction, around 25 minutes or so of uh, the talk. That's followed by questions and answers. And that's followed with people forming small groups for about half an hour or so to discuss the topic for the evening. Tomorrow evening, my theme is compassion. And following on the last half an hour, responses to that question and answers. So instead of just only being one long talk and then a short period for question and answers, things like that, it's two hours but there's real engagement of everybody. It's critically important. Teachers play a lower form, have a part to play, but it's you who are there sharing with each other. And so my first encouragement in terms of developing a mindful society, please um, get out of the front door as much as you can. Meet with people and talk with people. There is a lot of initiatives and curiosity going on. And you can bring your wealth of life experience to these kind of meetings. You can set them up and people can come together. And that's how things happen. And so in Totnes, for a period of time, we had Death Cafe. And Death Cafe was people met in one of the coffee shops. And I think there are 26, I counted them up one day, 26 coffee shops in this town. I got the impression nobody works. People just go to the coffee shop and developing and plotting all sorts of things. And hopefully, in fact, are the downfall of the British government and much more. So sometimes we have special interests. And with Death Cafe, people would meet sometimes six, eight, 10, 15 people. And the only subject is the relationship to death. And one got young people, people who've lost their loved ones, and people who are in the white-haired club, and uh, others sharing experiences together about life and about death. Somebody gets the idea. They put the word uh, out, put the posters up. I, I took posters, photographs of posters in the town um, and it was like dead during COVID, as you can all appreciate. And on that, by the way, it t has taken quite a long time since COVID, at least in the back, went to the background. It's still going, obvious, into the background. And it's taken quite a lot of time, a lot of work and commitment and dedication 
to the renewal of many kinds of groups, including mindfulness courses and that's and and the various buddhist centers and the yoga classes and so forth it it was like a, a an earthquake with scattering people into this horrendous lockdown that took place and now the renewal is coming back and sl slowly slowly with the patience with that the posters matter Sometimes in the mindfulness world with kind of spiritual ideas, which are really important uh, there, there's quite often a certain hesitancy or shyness about getting the word out. But if one doesn't get the word out, people won't know. And some people say, would say to me, oh, Christopher, I don't like promoting yourself. You're not promoting yourself. Please, it's, that's unhealthy. What you are doing is saying, here is a service. This is on offer. Are you interested to come and join it? And like um, <clears throat> um, the, uh, the great teacher from Nazareth, uh, Jesus said, don't hide your, the actual words I've got mistranslated. He said, don't hide your light under the table. There's a few mindfulness teachers who are very unsuccessfully or successfully hiding their light under the table. People need to know. Therefore, a lot of the work of mindfulness teachers is reaching out. Well, a lot of the work is putting the posters, using Facebook, using what social media, uh, uh, etc. And in the activity of uh, all of that there, lots and lots of love and appreciation and empathy for people, not only within the group that you might be leading, but outside of the group. Outside of the, the group, the email or the text message, the words of uh, empathy, the extra time you give to a person for a one-to-one. -one. All of that is part of the act of service. And I know many people uh, engaged in that. And I'm just giving a small reminder that most of us um, rely, rely upon <clears throat> word of mouth. And as I put at the start of one of my uh, websites, one of the things I've learned over the years as a mindfulness teacher and as a human being, that there are two big priorities for our species. One is <clears throat> to feel loved. The second is to feel understood. And my goodness me, mindfulness practice and teaching is about contributing to feeling others to feel they feel loved and they feel understood. And if that can be communicated, people get the nourishment. You'll see them again. They will speak to other people as well because they feel love. They feel understood and they feel this is a practice really working in the daily life. <clears throat> in the exploration <clears throat> of um, mindful society, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> There is a, <clears throat> a shift going from east to west, but be careful. And what I've got in mind here in terms of being careful, <clears throat> yes, people like me were brought up in the mindfulness world, in the Buddhist tradition, with all of its benefits and its limits. And the benefits is a, of a culture, of a society you might call the monastery, ongoing practice, complete service, and supported by villages and townspeople making it possible for us to practice, and much more. Limits, of course, the limits of the belief systems, the limits of flowers and candles and incense and all the religiosity. And that certainly isn't everybody's cup of tea. It's not my cup of tea uh, uh, either. And as one of my teachers once commented, flowers, candles, incense, temples, chanting, he said, is 
His words were, religion for thumb-sucking kids. And that, that's a monk talking, etc. But let's not get too conceited. And what I've got in mind, in a way, is the other extreme. And the other extreme is mindfulness can easily, and it comes across quite a lot, <clears throat> in a way, the danger of getting stuck as a branch of psychology. That small change. That's a very narrow way of looking at things. And when it's under a branch of psychology, it's got out of religion, and now it's under neuroscience, under psychology, <clears throat> um, a form, a met <clears throat> form, method, and uh, technique under evidence-based. And it's, whoa, it's slipped into that world. It needs some liberation from it. This is experience-based. We've got to trust what the people tell us. We've got to trust in what we listen to. And we've got to keep it free. And in that exploration, <clears throat> the wonderful thing that we have, and it's got some power to it in my view, is such a diversity of practices. And some of them <clears throat> you and I are very familiar with. Mindfulness of breathing, the body scan, exploring pain, looking at sensations, the observation of states of mind, seeing thoughts, an expansive open awareness, loving kindness meditations. In a way, they are a certain grounding principle but if you think mindfulness is just about that it's just the stepping stone if you think mindfulness is about just about being in the here and now one's really missing the point if you think mindfulness is just about the oneness experience this is kindergarten so the exploration and the challenge is to find the languages, it's not easy, where you communicate a sense of vast exploration. Otherwise, it will be reduced to the form. It will be reduced to a few oh. narrow practices. And I think mindfulness needs to be free from religiosity free from being a branch of something else, branch of psychology or a branch of religion, and to, to, to as it were, <clears throat> have a sense of the expanse of things. So to come back to repeat the point a little bit with you, the, the realm of mindfulness, it really is extraordinary. It's wonderful you have experienced, your teachers, to see the benefit and the gratitude of people being provided with tools for their daily life, which they never had before. Feeling what it is to really be clear in the moment, to touch upon their feeling tones there, to be listened to, to share experiences, and the collective the small groups and the one-to-ones is an extraordinarily powerful aspect to all of this. And with the confidence in what you have been offering already, then you say, okay, but what else? If stress reduction is the beginning, it's an early stage of mindfulness exploration, where do I go now? What other areas can I explore? And then that starts to open the doors up. One of them would be ethics, values. Not <clears throat> a code of morality, 
But what is our relationship to ethics, to values? Not implicit, as some mindfulness teachers say, but I mean explicit. It is actually brought into the conversation. It's the words, whatever words suit you, are actually used for this very simple reason, the people who suffer the most, the people who have the most mental health issues and problems, not always, but quite often, the people who don't have ethics. And there's a whole range of areas there. And there are people who are suffering terribly with really deep ethics. Nothing, no, no, haven't done any harm, haven't done anything bad whatsoever, are really, really suffering. To appreciate the goodness of such people, to appreciate what they offer, to appreciate their values. So they have a sense that despite the suffering, there is something deep and beautiful about this human being they need to be reminded. This is all part of the expansion. So in that we bring in the spiritual, we bring in the ethics, we bring in the mystical. For some of us, and I am one of those, who is quite comfortable with the language of God, G-O-D. And there are people who feel very uncomfortable with it. Therefore, we don't use it. So the language, but for others, are quite comfortable with it. And I have to say, come out of the tradition of the Buddha, the Buddha used the word God regularly. Not in so much the creator God of the, uh, uh, but God called Brahma Vihara, abiding with God. The, the Buddhist, contemporary Buddhists don't like, the, the, run away from the word and use the word divine. Brahma means God. <coughs> so again, do we have the freedom inside of ourselves to listen to the languages of people, to hear their experiences and give them the opportunity that if they like and appreciate the religious language, which is quite often alive in people more than we realize, let's listen to that. And if people really appreciate the use of psychological Western language, let's really listen to those people who are more comfortable uh, with that. So the teachers are not contracted into one form of language. Otherwise, we just get one form of people to go with it. it I'm just get, get I'm just getting into a role here, so but I'm I see the time is galloping by. However, let me give you give me a, a couple mi a couple minutes uh, uh, more. <clears throat> there are many areas. And I'll just I'll just take two of them, the big two two big ones here, which the mindfulness world has a lot to contribute. So one of them is war. So some of us, and I am certainly one of those, who believe and feel it is utterly irresponsible to take sides in war. Utterly irresponsible in so far as it feeds the conflict. It is utterly irresponsible to stay quiet and not say anything whatsoever. Mindfulness is not about feeding violence, feeding war by associating with one against the other. The common feature of war is that both sides think they are right. Both sides think that what they are doing is good. Both sides are saying we have no choice. Why would a mindfulness teacher who is speaking about awareness and kindness actually want to take sides? I 
and this is a person who is speaking not only with international experience in all of this, but with 30 years of annual visit with the Israelis and with the Palestinians. I know these two communities extremely well, extremely well, because I've listened to their suffering. Both sides, year in and year out, between 1992 to 2019. So, <clears throat> we, it is to find other ways and means, to be mindful of other ways and means than this primitive method of resolving human conflict by war. We have to find other voices. That certainly isn't easy. But we're paying respect to non-violence respect to empathy, respect to pointing the way to, the, to resolve suffering and staying true to it no matter what we are told. Stupid, irresponsible, naive, romantic, out of touch with reality and all the other um, dumpings that take place on people who refuse to give support to war. Period. End of story. So again, we have to look deep into ourselves. We have to explore all of this because the more we move into the world of mindfulness <clears throat> there, um, the more questions it raises about ourselves and the questions that other people will ask us. It is a big challenge and a big responsibility there. And we go slowly, step by step. And when sometimes you and I find ourselves in a situation, I just, I don't know what to say. I don't know what the answer is. Oh, and then it goes to the generality. Oh, nobody knows. Nobody has an answer. You're doing yourself, you're a human being. You're doing yourself a, a disservice. Dig deep. And therefore you might say, right now, I don't know. Right now, I don't have an answer. Right now, I don't know what to say to you, whatever that might be about. But my God, I'm going to find out. My God, I'm going to really look at myself. I'm going to find out what other people say. I'm really going to listen. Maybe somewhere that which I didn't know and didn't understand and had no answer for, something comes out of you. You wake up one morning, oh, I've understood something. It really is clear. And therefore, never settle for an answer which is, I don't know. That's part of the ongoing human journey uh, experience, and there's no end to the countless uh, explorations that we can, that we can take. Just finally, you now coming down to the last sentence or two uh, with you, and thank you, of course, to Lendonier uh, uh, with this and a kind of short summary uh, there. Please have regular contact with, with your networks, both of mindfulness teachers and people who know you and see you as a mindfulness teacher. Don't be shy of shedding your light. What I mean by that, if you, there are people in public service, in the public sector, doing wonderful work and are highly stressed out, it doesn't take too much to prepare a small resume, write a short letter and say what you can offer and what you have offered in the past. There are people in the private sector, in the business uh, world and more of that also can benefit. And it might be a way to nourish skillfully a change of values from pressure, being driven, profit, goals and so forth to a different kind of culture in the in the uh, private sector there there are people as well <clears throat> to give you a small uh, with, with young people with schools and to give a small example finally there i was rather uh, rather touched um, my daughter <clears throat> has a well-being center she had been meeting for several weeks with two children, if I remember rightly, around eight or 10 years of age, who were having a difficult time, 
as kids can have, both at home and at school and so forth. And the children were rather close and a bit, you know, didn't want to speak and things like that. It was all a bit strange. Mother went out for a coffee for an hour. Well, my daughter was um, <clears throat> connected with them. A few weeks later, one of the children in the classroom, her friend told her, was crying because she had been bullied. The girl was about 11, 10 years of age. And <clears throat> the uh, young student of my daughter <clears throat> said to her, look, we all have these experiences. Imagine you are a cloud. And as a cloud, the cloud comes and it passes and it goes. And this experience, like a cloud, it comes and it stays for a while and it passes uh, there. And the little girl was smiling. Oh, yes. And the school teacher, the class teacher, heard this and, and said to the girl, where did you hear that? That's wonderful. Oh, from my mindfulness teacher in the well-being center. Oh, and the children are forming, had been forming into buddies. And now this young girl who didn't want to speak, who seemed very controlled and tight, you know, and a bit fearful and not very much confidence. This girl is the mindfulness buddy for all the kids in the class. And so when they've got, you know, a bit anxious or worried or some, some problem, they go to this young 10-year-old and share with her. She's their mindfulness buddy. And the teacher said to her, Would you, could you give a talk on mindfulness? She said, oh, yes of, yes, of course. And she gave a talk on mindfulness. Never, never underestimate the wonder and the beauty of what we can offer, what we can share, and just how, and it's, benefit it just spreads itself let's be part of the agents of change let's be the caregivers all right enough thank you Stasi. <laughs> well thank you so much christopher from all the the different things you said i just have goosebumps now uh from gaza to the the the, the little girl who couldn't speak and now that that's exactly the beauty of of um, all these I, I now imagine that we are like bees going from flower to flower <laughs> i don't know maybe okay. because of my background i can see the flowers A beautiful background all flowers. Yeah, uh, but thank you so much now we have about 10 minutes for questions um to um christopher and to discuss this uh, how can we uh, we be really useful um outside of our um our bubbles <laughs> and and then really listening uh to the uh suffering of others wherever they are and in whatever form they come um so please uh, the floor is yours so questions and comments and let's have this uh, uh group now here it's just good conversation Yes, and, and I would like you, yeah. And sometimes in the chat column as well, um, you can always always put a question or a spoken. Yeah, I'll be following the chat. Any first questions on uh, all the range of topics on that Christopher covered? I, I don't know that I have a question, but I have a, um, a statement maybe that Christopher can speak to. Um, thank you, Christopher, listening to you. It's really inspiring and um, important as well, I feel, for myself to be reminded of the vastness of it. And, um, yeah, and to not betray that, um, to, to really keep it in mind. And... Um, when I think about, you know, <laughs> trying to, um, you know, uh, kind of go on that path, you, you know, of vast exploration and speaking about it, the first thing that comes to me is this, like, 
huge level of self-consciousness and there's a voice in my head kind of saying like get over yourself you know and <laughs> um and you know think about the service and think about the the you know the, the society and people and um but but again I'm just met with like a vast sense of inadequateness so um you know not ready yet don't know enough yet you know and I don't know maybe there's something you can you can say yeah. to to help dissolve that a little bit or <laughs> something um it's one of these areas where The, the the big step is the taking of the small step. Yeah. So what, what, what I mean is in the inner life and in the psychology of our inner life, issues, you know, I touched upon one or two of them, obviously, of the big issues can leave us with a feeling of being, these issues are so big, I am so small, and therefore a feeling of inadequacy. Who am I, such a small person on this planet, to be able to do something? Yeah. And yeah. as a sideways step for a moment, we've really got to be exceptionally mindful of all the information that pours into us every day. Mm. Because it may not be serving our deep interests. It actually can lead to a kind of feeling thought paralysis we can feel overwhelmed with the amount that's going on and the reason for that is we are actually <clears throat> the space to be an agent of change <clears throat> it's getting filled up with the excessive information mm. so the step here <clears throat> Our quiet authority is in, as I mentioned a moment or two ago, is in the small steps. It is finding the voice. And we kind of find the voice through the spoken. We find it through the written. And sometimes we find it through the doing. Mm. Or maybe a combination of all three. So we look at our life, we reflect on it. What can I offer? What can I contribute? The immediate voice was, I'm not ready. Um, or I'm not good enough, or I don't know enough. And it is terribly easy to identify with this voice because that's been the voice of the past, it's history. Mm. And the voice, <clears throat> authentic voice, is the one which leads to a step to taking some activity, to engage in some activity. And that might require from you some preparation. What are you going to say? What are you going to write? What are you going to do? Mm. And the confirmation of the authentic voice is sh shows itself in the action. Mm. The confirmation of an authentic voice <clears throat> shows itself in what we do. And when we listen to the voice and we follow it through, then we express the best of our being. Mm. Mm. Because it, it, it either we get handicapped by not speaking or writing or saying or doing, or we feel, or we get cynical. We go quiet. Mm -hmm. And the more violent, aggressive, hostile, egotistical voices will dominate the culture. Mm -hmm. We have to offer something different and we've got to be bold. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you, Deirdre. It's a great question, and yeah. we heard such inspirational thing. You know, the the big step is in the small steps. 
um yeah. and it's simple to know and very difficult to do um who who else has a question that is around this or maybe completely different topic yes richard please thank you um so it's it's not a it's not a fully formed question but i'll no. try and right. form it um um, but thank you, Christopher, because I mean, everything that you have been saying, it just it just sort of hits the well, it hits the notes for me, really. And one, one of the things that comes up is um, when I think about the um, and it, this is sort of my projection in a way I appreciate in the UK, but in the sort of mindfulness world um, where we have these we have training centers and membership bodies and we have this sort of. Um, industry like a professional industry um which has been you know co-opted by all the usual forces as is often the way you know um from the commercial and the neoliberal and all of that but you you mentioned you know um the branch of psychology um and the sort of narrowing um and it seems to me that really that's kind of one of the things that's happened with mindfulness over the last 10 20 years is there's a there's a sort of is there's a power thing really there's people who have a lot of say over what goes into an eight-week program for example so one of the things that seems to me anyway and I'm, i think i'm probably speaking for lots of other people is um it's not so much the content of of mindfulness programs that's the problem it's what's not in there it's the it's the it's the whether it be the the complicity of silence around war and everything and everything that's important in our world to the fact that ethics ethical engagement the the you know essential nature to be socially politically engaged is not um it's just not in the generic eight-week program it seems to me it's been it's very deliberately left out by um, with, from a, a conservative small c conservative mindset. So I mean I find my voice around this and some other people do as well. But it 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 does seem like there's a power imbalance here really, and there's just there's essential stuff that is not getting taught and not being introduced to people who are new to mindfulness or finding their way in mindfulness yeah um and, and what to do about that yeah <clears throat> so good really good points i share obviously plenty of the concerns and i don't expect everybody to go into politics and in big global issues and and uh, uh, so forth but at the moment, currently, the general conception, mine, is um, just needs a little bit more boldness uh, to it. And what I mean, mean by that is there are some people, their genuine heartfelt wish is to reduce anxiety, stress, the pains in the body, the worries in the mind, the sleeplessness, the chronic headaches, and much, much more. And the mindfulness world, bless it, is doing wonderful, absolutely wonderful work in this uh, area. <clears throat> and that's why it's developed such a good name on the street, so we put it like that. But then gradually, we, the mindfulness teachers, in a way, we need to kind of show the way forward and to look beyond the current model while not rejecting, being very respectful of its precious benefits to millions of people. But what other ways can, what other areas do we really need to be mindful of? And then into that comes a whole new dialogue. Uh, but it's the mindfulness teachers who will um, inspire this. 
we we have to we 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 are the ones who set the tone and having it as part of the the conversation and my trust is in terms of social environmental political and so forth <clears throat> is in the grassroots movement uh and to give support to people in the grassroots movement who are really committed doing precious important things for people animals and the environment and we as mindfulness teachers could give courses and give teachings and give them support so they're less stress about all the work that they are engaged in huge huge numbers of people let's reach out and see what we can offer and it's there's those kind of areas there and, and keep every conversation um, 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 an exploration what is the mindfulness practice for people in the arts to me the arts are something genuine in the best sense it's something quite spiritual about the best of the arts and as mindfulness teachers we can support that we can find find ways with our musicians and our composers and our poets and our dancers and our people in the theatre and the people in literature and much more <clears throat> to help bring some deep insights which can then be transferred, transmitted uh, into the world of the arts. So it's not so corrupted with gross materialism, huge egos. Of course, that's bound to happen if we're not exploring arts as something deep and something profoundly beautiful. Egos will get in the way. So just a small example of what I mean by exploration. Mm. Yes, anyone please. Yeah, if it will be the last question before we go in small group to discuss or share our experiences. Um, does anyone have a question that want to everybody to hear or sharing and then we'll go in small groups. I could ask a question. Yeah, please do. Yeah. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello. Thank you very much. I didn't unfortunately catch the beginning of your talk, Christopher, but thank you. I like uh, this exploration. I suppose when you talked about the arts, I'm curious about the dumbing down of the arts and I'm I'm I had an interesting sort of thought that the films that we're being shown today are very different from the films that I saw in my 20s um there was more intellectual challenge and risk taking and so I'm wondering about what's happening you know generally mm in terms of us being dumbed down yeah 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 <clears throat> one's got good good question where we've in a way it's uh there is an assault on our senses and once again keeping the eyes and ears open i mean to take a small example <clears throat> Sometimes we just hear something from somebody else. So coming to the cinema for a moment, a friend just two days ago went to see a, a film, movie, in um, in Vienna, and said said to me, the film um, is called Perfect Day, and it's about uh, it made in Japan. Winders, the um, German um, filmmaker, uh, made it about a man in Japan whose job is looking after the toilets. And I haven't seen it. I, I did have a look at the trailer on uh, YouTube. And I thought, what well, little bit I learned from my friend, as well as uh, with the YouTube and, and uh, some discussion about this, it's about a person living a truly mindful way of life with quiet contentment and just going about his daily business. 
in a very caring, empathetic, mindful way. And I thought that if I had my way, if I could be a, a dictator, I wouldn't hesitate if I was offered the job, by the way. There, when there is good cinema, as an example, right when the film ended, I would have somebody on that stage there speaking about the depth of insight and what are we going to do? There is some excellent cinema. There's some wonderful documentaries there. We need persons doesn't it, who can just go on the stage and say, those who'd like to stay behind for half an hour, what steps can we make? What can we do together? And so fiction and nonfiction have the same capacity to reveal great insights and great truth. But we need a cultivation of society that says yes, together. Yeah. Thank you for this, uh, Christopher and Tanya, for this question. I'm a, a fan of the of cinema and, and all the new movies and everything. And there is enough to get nourished, I would say. Um, let's now split into maybe groups of three three groups um and um i guess uh christopher and i can uh, go into a group as well and and discuss a question that uh, it's a very wide one actually but uh we could i'm putting it i'm leaving it here in the chat as well uh here goes we could share experiences from maybe even projects that if somebody already is doing something something for their community um outside of of the, the daily uh work in the industry mm -hmm. or within it um something that wider community is engaged as a community and um uh, being an activist or even agent of change um so any questions before i split you in a small groups we'll have 10 minutes for that it's just the beginning of of this discussion you can always continue it you can even take uh, contact of the people if you get come up with an idea together um that to develop further in in the future so feel free to to do that um ideas for future projects or or now uh sharing what what uh, we've already you've been already doing okay oh katarina helped me already <laughs> to do that um Okay, Katerina, would you want to join one of the groups too? Okay, and I'm joining one too.
discussion was about. Um, and uh, then to um, maybe ask the last questions um, and, and close this meeting tonight. So which group would like to start first? Whatever is um, being in fire to share <laughs> what what ideas you exchanged huh? Huh? Pablo would you like to share okay um should we start then from my group? <laughs> we were um, discussing something around Croatia and two Croatian words that uh, were uh, really uh, Magdalena as being part of our group um, was sharing. So I guess maybe inviting Magdalena to, to say to everyone uh, what these words are that struck her when listening to Christopher. Would you please? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, it just struck me uh, these expressions go out from psychology and go out from neuroscience. It's a much more vast exploration. And uh, as I was engaged in many different groups and trying to uh, introduce mindfulness without telling anything about mindfulness. So I used the word sabra nos, which means be pulled together and discern what is right, what is valuable, what is meaningful, what is good for me and for you and for all of us. And this is what people can understand. It is yeah. some sort of uh, universal ethics yes. that can go through words and then it's uh, 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 instead of using word mindfulness in Croatian, I use word predah, which means take a break, but the word dah means breath, so it means take a breath. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet, yes, good one. Yeah. Yeah. We can teach mindfulness without the word mindfulness. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. yeah. Wonderful. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So nothing, uh, uh, because it, nothing strange, nothing uh, very special, but simple, you can find in yourself. Yes. Yeah, lovely. Mm -hmm. Lovely. <clears throat> Thank you, Magdalena. Anyone in, from the other groups? Um, I can speak. Yeah. Um, so we kind of like each one of us um, offering maybe on a more smaller level, like teaching or doing retreats or teaching breathing or yoga or mindfulness. So that was one part of our sort of contribution to our communities where we live. Um, and then we spoke about Mindful Cities, the project, which I hadn't heard of, it, of but Benoit introduced it um, and how that would work, sort of introducing mindfulness and the authorities across all levels sort of, of public sector workers, how that could be an effect on the city life and the... Uh, I would guess the intentions and the vibe. Um, I personally contributed that I, I, my project is to offer mindfulness um, to the teachers in schools, uh, where I think that um, is really important because the children are really lack respect and freedom and understanding and listening. So um, that was my contribution. And um, yeah. If, I don't know if somebody else from the group wants to add something, if I forgot something. Thank you. I could come in with a short comment on the, uh, there. <clears throat> um, if one is living in an area where one, where the language of mindfulness or yoga or spirituality or homeopathy or healing is fairly in the culture, um, it might be an opportunity to have a, a meeting, to, to give a personal example, what I mean by this is um, I'm hoping I'm, when I spot her on the high street sometime, 
to meet with the um, the deputy mayor of Tutnes. Um, she and I go to the same coffee shop. And I want to introduce her, because she has some influence, to for the town council to meet and designate Totnes as a mindful town. Uh, and so it becomes a kind of general umbrella concept for a whole range of caring, thoughtful initiatives which are taking place. Uh, and I believe the town, the council that is, may, I believe they actually might well respond to it. So in other words, sometimes we have to make a, a step, approach with a fresh idea, whatever it might be about, <clears throat> and in that language of communication, seeing if we can find the language which the person will respond to. And um, I quite often, well, about 30, 40 years ago, if I may say, I did a couple of books of interviews of people whose lives really touched me, who really engaged in service. So I ended up with a couple of books coming out. And sometimes with uh, people, again, there can be a hesitation to meet with such people. Oh, they're so busy. They're da -da 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 -da. Nobody is that busy. If one's got a really good idea and must want to have a, a conversation with that person or a recorded question and answer session, lots of people really like that, appreciate that, and can uh, oh, <clears throat> make that happen. So keep your good eyes and ears open for what the town might do or the city might do. Keep your good eyes and ears open for people that you could um, um, meet, meet, meet with. You might even organize a small group meeting or a public talk or whatever and have a real exchange about something. All, 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 all this, you know, we can do. Another example in Totnes, when with the refugee crisis, this is a couple of years ago now, there was a meeting in the town hall. The head of the Red Cross came and he said he'd been, the, the town hall was full, packed tight. So people, various friends, organized this meeting and he said he's been speaking in major cities the last 12 years this was the biggest group that he'd spoken to in the 12 years and we're a town of 8,400 mm -hmm. and environment and people just talk together in the coffee shops talk together about this and that and keep your good eyes and ears open see what other people might be thinking and suddenly a meeting can happen yeah, yeah, good things happen. People having the long tradition of this around the coffee shop, having a conversation, taking getting some ideas and running with it. Yeah, the culture has changed. So with the cafes, you've been changing the culture and making people ready to come. Uh, everybody to this yeah. meeting. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Yeah. Magdalena, you have, uh, yeah. I think you want to share with the now the uh, Caring Cities project, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to say it is a project that is uh, led by an association which is starting to bring together mindfulness teachers in Croatia. It is a small country and there is a lot of them, but we are trying to come together and this project is the idea of the project is to first in the first phase and the name of the project is mindful cities uh, uh, cities and counties that care so uh, first to teach uh, civil servants in this cities and counties the mindfulness the core of the mindfulness and then to uh, encourage them in phase two to uh, see how can use their own mindful skills to do the activities that are important and valuable and meaningful in this uh, community. And then in third phase, bring people together to sense mindfulness as a social, safe and 
comfortable community. I, I miss yeah. the English words. I can say it nicely in Croatian. So this is a huge idea, and we 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 will uh, teach each other how to do this, so we can have a lot of people. We will see how it will go, but that's the idea. <laughs> and we have a great, great help from Amba. It's uh, wind in the back. <laughs> It's, it's a Thank you. Lovely, lovely thing. Thank you. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, great example. Uh, really good. Um, yeah. Well, people, we are already beyond our time. Um, a last sharing. We didn't hear the last group or question that you want to ask Christopher. And I'm really full with uh, personally with uh, gratitude for all this, uh, the beginning of conversations yeah. on that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone last words, sharing, question? Can I last? Yes, just, I just want to say that I'm uh, what's really inspiring for me these days also is uh, Joanna Macy's work, The Work That Reconnects. Oh, yeah, I'm familiar with that. That's really blending activism and Buddhist teachings. And I think that uh, this is also really helpful for people who are thinking about actually how to go out into the world and, and take this and actually do some good so i just wanted to say that too that i think it's really also wonderful work yeah thank you i th th think people know may know the name joanna macy and um she, she is as we just heard she's remarkable uh bridge between the inner and the outer outer world uh she's uh a few years ahead of me or i'm not, not far behind her uh, with the years and Joanne and I, Joanne and I have known each other like 30 years we've taught together. She is a remarkable soul. She's, yeah, keep your eyes open. There's some, some wonderful people around in this world. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we continue this, the conversation. We'll perhaps mm. uh, do uh, more talks like that. Uh, we have already emails and we, we know how to find each other. Um, thank you, Christopher, so much for this inspirational uh, words and, and, and your thoughts and, and the feeling that you were uh, speaking about. Oh, and um, uh, seriously, we, we discussed the universe here. So many topics uh, for such a short time. Um, thank you, everybody who uh, showed up tonight. Um, thank you. And uh, yeah, gratitude to everyone. And take care of yourselves, as Christopher said, nourish yourselves to be able to be the light. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you much. You. Thanks, Daddy. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Can everybody. You stay for a moment because Stasi has one more request. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, I will share in the chat. Thank you, Katerina, for reminding me. Um, this in the chat is a link to our survey. We starting survey really to hear the voices of the members and the teachers and our colleagues so that we um, create the uh, um, events and the whole year program um, around your needs and what really engages you. So thank you for uh, filling these forms and um, yeah, we'll share them again and again every time when we meet together. So as, as, as soon as uh, you actually fill it in, uh, the better, the, the sooner the better because otherwise we'll forget them. So. <laughs> Have a good evening again. Bye. Thank you. Good evening. Bye. 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 Thank you.